What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today's video, we are back with another episode of Lions Latest, where we go through the latest Detroit Lions news. And today, we have another addition to this Lions roster. We have another signing, a free agent signing, another potential weapon for this offense. So let's get it started. I'm fired up. It's made a great decision. Great teammates, coaches, and other people who want to be Super Bowl champions. And we are. We're going to do it this year. And we're going places because we want to go places. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Before long, where are they going to be the last one standing? Welcome, everybody, to my video. Glad you guys are here. We're back with another episode of Lions Latest. We love these type of videos. Currently, I'm working on my Aiden Hutchinson video, our final draft video, but I had to put that off. I had to put that off, put it in the back for a second because we got some news today. The Lions have made another addition to their roster. Recently, we've had a couple of retirings. Most recently, John Penasini. Still miss you, John Penasini. John Penasini retiring from the game of football. Because of things like that, the Lions have a couple of roster spots open. Well, today they have announced that they're going to be adding a weapon to one of those roster spots to compete this offseason for a potential role on the 53-man roster. And we're talking about a former Michigan Wolverine. We're talking about a tight end wide receiver hybrid Devin Funches. You may remember Funch, okay? Devin Funches, a former second round pick by the Carolina Panthers going back to 2015. They traded up 16 spots in that year's draft to get Devin Funches another weapon to an offense that had a few weapons at the time. I think Stewart was the running back. They had Greg Olson. They had Calvin Benjamin. So they went out and they got Devin Funches. They wanted to get another weapon. And at the time, they didn't really know exactly what to label him. Is he a tight end? Is he a receiver? And they're like, yeah, he's a receiver for us. He's just a big receiver. Didn't run a great 40 times. So some people were thinking, man, maybe he's a tight end. However, he was utilized as a receiver. And that's how he's been utilized in the NFL since he's joined the NFL back with the Carolina Panthers and man he's had some productive seasons specifically with Carolina but after leaving Carolina he has bounced around to multiple teams he has not seen the field very much at all mainly due to injuries and now here he is with the Lions with an opportunity to prove that he should be on an NFL roster we're going to talk about his role what he brings to the table all of that kind of stuff but first let's just do a quick little background on the path for Devin Funches leading to the Detroit Lions Carolina trades up 16 picks they select him in the second round with pick number 41 back in 2015 out of Michigan he was rocking the number one he was the number one wide receiver he had a nice little thing going for him that he was known as this tough receiver that was playing through injuries but he was the top guy he wasn't your normal you know number one receiver he wasn't very speedy of course he was much bigger but that's because he was kind of like a tight end that played the receiver position and, you know NFL teams are always looking for that matchup nightmare they're looking for that guy that just gives you problems no matter where you put him on the field so he was drafted pretty high goes to Carolina, and he's pretty productive. You know, his first season there, he has 473 yards receiving. His second season, he starts in seven games where he has just under 400 yards receiving. In 2017, you really start to see his production take off. He had over 100 targets that year. He had over 800 yards, 840 receiving yards, as well as eight touchdowns. It's a big part of his game. And in 2018, that took a little bit of a step back, missed some time, had 549 yards, 44 receptions, and four touchdowns. That's pretty much the last we've seen of Devin Funches. However, he has been on multiple teams since that time in 2018. His next stop was the Indianapolis Colts, where he only played in the first game of the season for the Indianapolis Colts, where he had three receptions on five targets for 32 yards, no touchdowns in that game. You actually could see the play that he got injured towards the end of the game. He broke his collarbone. He was out for the season. So you really didn't see him in 2019 with Indianapolis. However, he was given some money now. He's given a one-year deal, a pretty expensive one-year deal, right? It was kind of one of those prove-it trial deals we've definitely Definitely given those out. That's what the Indianapolis Colts gave to Devin Funches, and it looked like he was going to be pretty impactful early on, but unfortunately, the injury knocked out for the season, so they don't get to see him in 2019. That leads us to 2020. His next stop was the Green Bay Packers. Green Bay Packers decided they wanted to give him a chance. They wanted to give him a one-year deal. They wanted to give him over a million dollars in base salary with some bonuses that could potentially lead that con contract a little bit higher. However, I didn't even know he was with the Green Bay Packers. You may not have either, and that's because he didn't play with the Green Bay Packers. You go to 2020, 
2020. It's the COVID year. He opts out of 2020 season. He said, I think on Instagram, that some of his closest family members were dealing with it. So he decided to opt out of the 2020 season. So we don't see him that year. Now, as we know, he still technically would be under contract for the next season. And that he was for Green Bay. Now, he took a pay cut because the Green Bay Packers were having issues financially. Takes a pay cut, stays with Green Bay, but you really don't see him very much. Now, we did get to see him in the preseason. And he played in their first preseason game where he was outstanding. He was electric. Guy had six receptions, 70 yards. And you're like, oh, wow, he looks like a playmaker here. Now, I didn't pay attention to Green Bay's preseason, so I didn't even know that this was happening. I don't think I did. However... It doesn't last very long with Green Bay because unfortunately he's dealing with a hamstring injury that's kind of just lingering. He is placed on IR and a few days later the Green Bay Packers decide to cut ties. So we really don't see him with the Packers either. And that leads to his most recent stop before the Detroit Lions. That's being picked up that same 2021 season towards the end of the year by the San Francisco 49ers being placed on their practice squad. But not much later, he was released by the San Francisco 49ers. And now here he is in 2022 as a free agent, a 28-year-old former second round pick that going back to his time with Carolina since then he really has not been able to find the field he has now signed with the Detroit Lions and he's going to be given an opportunity here I don't know the contract details however the Lions did say he would play tight end we'll talk about that however I'm assuming it's not much guarantee money it's just an opportunity to see what you can do and compete possibly for a roster spot this season let's pull it back a little bit Devin Funch is coming out of Michigan put up some pretty good combine test scores now again his 40 time was not great so I have people thinking well maybe he is a tight end he ran a 4 7 40 he definitely looks faster than that on it in terms of his play speed I was expecting to look a little bit slower when you watch him but he looks he moves pretty darn well when you watch him on film so he posted a 4 7 40 17 bench press reps 38 and a half inch vertical which is definitely impressive for a guy at his size that listed in at six foot four 225 pounds now, i know what you're thinking wait hold up the line said this guy's gonna play tight end he's 225 pounds i don't know his exact weight i think some people believe he's in the 230s mid 230s now at this point but because of the position that he played of course he wasn't going to put on a lot of weight you're trying to play receiver I'm not going to balk up 250 doesn't make any sense but I know what you're thinking with the Lions wait a minute how is he going to play tight end well I would just say this think about Shane Zilstra very similar build to a Shane Zilstra at the tight end position and what we know about Dan Campbell is that he said specifically that they were looking for more of a receiving threat in the tight end room so look at guys like Shane Zilstra's very similar type of build there and again he's going to have an opportunity to compete for that role what that sounds like right you're thinking tight end you're thinking oh he's always playing in line he may get reps in line keep in mind that guys like Shane Zilster that we saw last season a lot of his usage came from the slot a lot of it came split out put up on the line of scrimmage moved out you know against linebackers one-on-one on the outside he may be more of a tight end than what he was in the past is like a pure wide receiver but at the same time he's still going to be moved around and flexed around just based on his skill set it just makes sense that that's what you would do with him the blocking side is a little bit more of a projection especially when you're talking about blocking in line because we really haven't seen it i spent time watching his 2018 film with the carolina panthers watched him with the green bay packers in the preseason i've watched the 2019 with the indianapolis colts you just haven't seen a lot of that in line you know blocking so that's a little bit of a projection there but again i view this similar to a role like a shane zilstra honestly you could take it back a little bit to a guy like jimmy graham when jimmy graham came out of course he was much bigger he's listed at like 266 six but he was another good athlete even though this guy i think moves better on film he looked like a, he was a good athlete coming out, and even though he was listed as a tight end, he still was utilized one-on-one -on, -one on linebackers, put him in the slot, split him out a little bit, get a creative, find a way to get him the football. Meanwhile, they had a guy like Josh Hill, which was more of their blocking tight end, right? So I expect this to be more of a receiving threat and compete for that role because that's what the Lions said that they're looking for. They have the Hawkinsons, who's going to be the one. They got a James Mitchell who can block and make things happen once the ball is in his hands. We just know we haven't seen him yet because he's still returning from injury. That was the draft pick this season. And you have the depth with the Brock Wrights, the Garrett Griffins, the Nolan Givens. But they're looking for a guy that can compete uh, for more of a receiving position at the tight end spot and let's just keep it simple lions need weapons and what we saw last season is that they needed more weapons and at the tight end position specifically they feel like they didn't maybe get the production that they needed out of shane zilster when hawkinson wasn't there so that's important even though zilster's name has been coming up a lot so far and it seems like he's doing very well in the early offseason program never never hurts to add some competition and i know we say it a lot but this definitely seems like a high upside type of addition with very low risk because if it doesn't 
doesn't work out, you cut the guy. Okay, big deal. However, he definitely has a high ceiling. And just from his tape alone, you can see that. I'm not talking about going back to Michigan and saying, well, what do you do at Michigan? He did some things in Michigan, okay? We know what he was about there. However, even in the NFL, he has shown a very high ceiling that's potential, but he hasn't put it all together yet. And obviously part of it starts with staying on the field consistently. I mean, let's talk about what I see for him in terms of a skill set. Again, it's a little bit more of a projection when you're talking about his ability in line, specifically as a blocker. When you see him, he definitely shows the willingness to block. When I watch him on film, I don't see a guy that's trying to avoid being involved or engaging in terms of blocking, but you definitely see a guy that seems to have an issue staying connected to players when he blocks. It seems like his technique's all out of whack. He kind of rushes it just kind of lunges into defenders. There isn't much clean connection there as a blocker. However, what you do see, especially when the run is designed his way and he knows that he's going to be involved in the play, he does consistently look for work. He looks for the next guy to block after the first block that he picks up. So I definitely see a willing blocker, but again, it's still a projection when you're talking about blocking in line, but I wouldn't think that'd be much of his role anyway. This is more of a sub package offensive type of weapon. This is not a guy that you're probably putting out there a ton, maybe in like 12 personnel. I mean, you could, but he definitely seems to be more of a spread you out a little bit type of weapon where when we go to spread out a defense, which guys can consistently win their, win their one-on-ones? Which guys do we feel like can win their one-on-ones? And which guys can continue to have that impact over the middle if there is no TJ Hawkinson? He's dealt with injuries. He's missed time. So if there is no Hawkinson, who picks up the slack? Lines are still looking for a threat there that's consistent and puts pressure on the defense when that is the case. First off, you talk about his release. Now, what I like is I feel like his receiver experience has really helped him mold in terms of the route running as a whole. However, when you talk about the release, getting off the line of scrimmage, he didn't see a lot of jam press situations, specifically when I look back at 2018 or with the Packers or with the Colts. However, he does show plenty of variety necessary, I think, especially for a guy his size, to consistently win off the line of scrimmage. Coming out of college, what he did well is he was really able to use his physicality. It was tough to jam him because he could really retaliate with that same strength off the line of scrimmage. What I also see, though, is quick enough feet to vary releases. You see single releases, you see double releases, you see speed releases, and you see adequate burst off the line of scrimmage that I'm going to say, honestly, I didn't expect. Free releases that turn into speed releases for him, there is unquestionably adequate burst to get off the line and put some pressure on defenses. Extremely explosive for his size. Less agile, but more explosive, more burst off the line. Now, it starts to minimize a little bit. I think the wider you put him is on a cornerback, but specifically, if he's getting lined up against linebackers and safeties, even slots, it's definitely good enough for a single or speed release to attack the middle of the field, to attack the intermediate levels. I say that because I believe that's where he is his most dominant. I didn't know what to expect watching Devin Funches. I was thinking maybe he's a deep threat. I don't know what he is. Is he an underneath checkdown guy? Devin Funches is a guy that dominates in the intermediate range. That's where he's a big time problem. And it makes sense that that's what the Lions will be looking for because, again, that's what Hawkinson can really bring to the table. A guy that can run the route tree if he can run it out one on one, right? We've seen that. They have him toe tap the sideline, pick up a big time first down for us from some of these tight releases. I think he could be very effective from a tight release. Maybe not necessarily a stack release, but just some of those tight splits that you have where he's pushing up a little bit more on the line of scrimmage. But still playing in a stand-up role here he is on a tight split on the top of the screen here teams like to put him up on the line of the scrimmage and you will notice some of the maybe lack of flexibility when it comes to scooping passes but in this game like the atlanta falcons game you saw a lot of kind of being utilized as the underneath safety blanket now this is something i did notice at michigan as well is that you would see especially tackling the middle the willingness to leave his feet to make the play but as you saw there taking his eyes off the ball a little bit too early can lead to drops worried about where the hit is coming from when you get him in those type of sets where you can run the out routes where you can run drags over the middle where you can run delayed slants his route tree was arguably a little bit limited in terms of what i've seen teams ask him to do but it also makes sense because it plays to his strengths in those certain type of routes a dig route over the middle really anything that you could think of in terms of attacking the intermediate levels of the field that's where he seems to be his most impactful you can hit him on some vertical routes if you get him on one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one with a linebacker on the outside you can take that shot but the intermediate level of the field is where he seems to be the most dominant. Here Funches is at the bottom. They're going to run a little bit of an over route. You're going to get this single release off the line and then a little route nuance to hold up field. That way he can create space, catch and run. And you saw Green Bay utilize this a lot. These over routes, these drags, these crossers for him to catch and run. And by the way, his hands look much better in this game. So again, his hands could have improved because these Carolina clips are back in 2018. Speaking of his route running, I think what you see is a guy that's extremely, extremely understanding of holding integrity 
agility through his route and really selling with his upper body. This is not the quickest nor the fastest receiver. So if you're going to create separation, specifically when he was lined up on the outside, you better sell the heck out of those routes. Because if you're going to be asked to run a double move, if you're going to, you know, if it's situations like that, if you're going 20 plus yards, you really need to sell those routes and understand the route running side to a very high level. And I think he's very good at that. Now, this is where we talk about being a red zone threat. When you look at the Lions and they get into the red zone, as I said, I think their standout threat is TJ Hawkinson. He's the guy you trust. He'll win the one-on-ones. He'll get open. He'll make the play. I don't even need to see him. If he's one-on-one, I'm going there. With that said, behind Hawkinson, you do say a little bit, okay, who's the next big-time red zone threat that we have? I'm not even sure who that is right now. I don't know who that is between Jameson and, and St. Brown. You can get creative, but just the guy that you say, oh, he's got a one-on-one. We're at the 15-yard line. Get give him the football or even further inside, you're still trying to figure out who that is. Funches then can add another element there of that guy, where even though he's labeled as a tight end, he and Hawkinson could both potentially be on the field at the same time once you get into those situations, and you can try to attack one-on-one. Where I think he's really good is about 15, 20 yards out when you put him in situations to run double moves, especially when the field is a little bit condensed like that. It could be more threatening over the top, meaning when he's on the outside and you saw it, he wasn't always threatening to cornerbacks and safeties, where it was like, man, he might get over the top, right? If you're in a cover three drop he's never going to make a guy turn and run he just doesn't have that type of speed where teams are very worried about that outside presence it limits his ability a little bit to create some of that separation in terms of working back to the football routes like that but when you put him inside the 20 yard line now he's a little bit more threatening over top because of how quickly he can get into the end zone and be an issue so when you see double moves his ability to win with double moves you watch him sell it with his eyes you watch him sell it with his shoulders his upper body to really hold that route combined with good wide good quarterback timing to really hold that and then break back outside one note that i took is i felt like he had pretty Pretty loose hips especially for a guy at his build he's got pretty loose hips and ability to change direction which I didn't necessarily anticipate at that level that he would be able to do that that he'd be able to change directions run double moves and be successful like he is while also looking pretty loose there and not extremely stiff this is where he's dominant another example of something similar but it's just about putting it up there for him and one thing he was fantastic at a college was you could just have him box out a defender put it up just let him to go get it and that's what he's great at is that body control at the catch point to go get it you see it coming in and out of breaks his ability to break down and get back to the ball better than i anticipated i know he's not the fastest guy but it's still better than i anticipated because he is a little bit loose you can see at the top of routes running routes but then it's just the understanding we talk about route integrity you all see the ability to attack a blind spot understanding attacking cornerbacks blind spot he did it here against darius slate a very high level great job attacking blind spot then breaking back inside he's also good with the route timing at the top of the route so you run him on digs deep intermediate passes right where he's kind of the second level weapon underneath of a safety those routes he does really well at pulling off understanding making himself a target for the quarterback really syncing up that timing and then of course as we said the route nuance to understand okay let me kind of put myself create a little bit of separation on top of this route let me get some contact here with the corner and then work my way off but it's those little things that he has seemed to do at a very high level which when you take that and you put that in the slot you put that at the tight end position when he's playing closer to the line now it becomes very dangerous because linebacker safeties are going to have big time issues keeping up with that slots slot corners had issues keeping up with some of those single speed releases what you see is through his route he plays through contact pretty well he's tough you can't really throw the guy off his route he's got some he's got some size to him now so specifically against cornerbacks they had issues again against linebackers maybe a little bit more projection but i think he shows route strength he does show up with issues aside from injuries is pass catching everybody's seen the stats i think he had seven drops in 2018 according to pro football reference uh, and then uh, uh, one in 2019 he only played the one game you have to catch the ball consistently that's an issue his catch rates are not high enough they are too low i think one season was under 40 percent like that's awful that's not good that's not a good at all so when you talk about catching the football why does this show up one thing i will say for sure though i have to at least point this out to be fair to him not all of the incomplete passes in the low catch rate is on him i don't know how they necessarily qualify what a drop is because there's certain ones that are like yeah hey, yeah that's not really a drop it's kind of more of a pass breakup but that's also his fault that it was a pass breakup right so you get those things and he absolutely has drops but when you talk about the catch rate you talk about the catch percentage there are definitely targets that are just completely uncatchable and i would say there is unquestionably so many games that i watched where i was just like dude the, the timing here with cam newton the ball placement is really questionable it is not good it's not giving him much of a chance whatsoever you're throwing it completely behind him you're asking a guy at six foot four to 
make that play, he can't do it, right? Throwing it way over his head, giving him no shot with the timing. There was definitely some very questionable ball placement. So I will say in fairness to him, don't put the complete catch percentage on him because it's not. With that being said, his hands definitely are not the most reliable either. Now we've seen him have great catches. Biggest place I see issues with his hands are specifically on routes that start to kind of drip up, drift up the field. So you're talking about a quick slant, routes like that, routes that drift up a little bit where a cornerback's trying to undercut or trying to, you know, catch back up to the football. And right, if that ball's not led in front of him, it's not put out in front of him. In some situations, you can't put that ball in front of him. I see an issue of late hands, very late hands, where you'll see a lot of times he can catch kind of the back of the football where he's not really getting up on it. The ball gets through his hand, starts to work his way into his body, and then it just pops out. And this happens a lot. Passes are not led for him. You do see issues, especially even, even at passes that are just chest level, when, right? When they're kind of working into his body or he's having to slide down, sit down, make the grab, they're behind, things like that. Another example, I love his release on this play, how he uses his shoulders, his eyes to set up this quick outside flat route. However, it's the finish that's the issue here. Letting this ball get through his hands, not really attacking this football and snagging it. Instead, the defender gets involved. The issues with his catch technique doesn't attack the football in those situations, so it allows guys to break the pass up because he doesn't go out and get it. Instead, he kind of lets it come to him. All of a sudden, defender gets involved and they knock it away. When you see him trying to catch these low passes, specifically like scooping a pass off the turf, where it becomes an issue is he goes to the slide down into the grab and it can get up on his chest before he gets his hands on it. And of course, that's going to lead to it bouncing out without being able to really cradle it in. But I also do believe as well as he can get up for passes here, you see him at the top on this dig route. I also do think there may be a legitimate lack of flexibility in his lower body to scoop passes off the ground without going down to one knee. He catches a lot of passes like this and he drops passes like this where he's always scooting down to one knee. That's where he shows inconsistency in terms of hands. He'll drop those uncontested. So when you talk about being reliable and you talk about within the five yard line, winning your one on one, he will get that space. The issue is he doesn't always come up with the football. He's made some great catches. He's made some fantastic catches going back to his time with Michigan. Another issue I did notice is I think there are way too many occasions where he tries to catch it with one hand. He has a pretty good catch radius and some nice flexibility, but the issue is a lot of times he only puts up one hand. There are a lot of routes where he'll just put one arm up for the football and he doesn't even show an attempt to put his other arm to it like he's trying to make the one hand a grab and of course he doesn't make that play very often. So definitely inconsistent hands. However, the catch radius is definitely beneficial. When he's playing at full speed like this, you do see grabs like that where he just snags it out of the sky. Now, what I do like is what he does once the ball is in his hands, and this is his rack ability. I think you see how clean and fluid the transition is from catch to run, and he consistently makes himself a threat as soon as the ball hits his hands. He's tough to bring down. I know this is said a lot. Well, he's big. He's tough to bring down. This is legit with him. He is tough. He fights for extra yards. He runs through contact. He cleanly transitions from catch to run quickly. I'm not saying he's elusive when the ball's in his hands, even though we've seen him jump over guys. He's a good athlete. He's a good athlete for a guy at his build. With that being said, though, he is an immediate threat as soon as the ball hits his hands. He was a screen threat at times for Michigan going back. And for a guy at his bills, you don't expect that. He's not the fastest. He's not the most you know, explosive or shifty. But he is powerful and he's quick to transition. I love what he does with the ball in his hands. And to tie that together, what he does really well is he has a great feel for where the first down is. Great field awareness. And you will see him drag guys to the first down. You'll see him stick out the football. He has a great feel for where he needs to get to based on where he caught the ball. If I'm sure I'm picking that up. That's the kind of sense you get. And I get the same sense in terms of sideline awareness as well. Now, does he always come down with it inbounds? Not always. This is an example of what he can be. You're going to get the hesitate off the release, then the burst, and then watch him work back to the football. He barely breaks down. It's like two steps and he's back to the ball, toe tap. And again, he's good at high pointing back to the football. Beautiful. He's been a good back shoulder threat. So I don't want to say like he can't catch at all. He can. He's a good back shoulder threat. This is an area where Jimmy Graham gave a lot of teams problems. I mean, he hasn't been with Saints since 2014. I didn't even realize that. But one-on-one -on, -one on a sideline, you throw a back shoulder pass, he gives guys problems there. Talk about an out route or some kind of deep hook deep curl, working back to the ball in those situations. I like the way that he works back to the catch point, you know, from where the bass is thrown. He does seem to work back towards the catch point, work back to the ball in those situations when his route is taking him there. He can definitely catch underneath here against off coverage on this quick slant. The issue becomes is when he has to flip his pass technique to scoop passes or passes that are below chest level. If it's up, he's much better at this. It's just trying to scoop passes where he's inconsistent. But I also like the fact that he can, if a ball gets above his head, he has a very rangy wide catch radius which is effortless for him to just snag passes out of the air.
intermediate portion of the field is where he's at his best, is where he's the most dominant. I think the competition is really good at this spot between the Shane Zilstras, possibly a James Mitchell when he comes back from his injury, maybe at training camp, right? The competition between him and Nolan Given, right? You're trying to get those guys that they feel like can be threats in terms of receiving game. We did see the Saints in 2020, last year Campbell was there, keep three tight ends, Adam Troutman, a Jared Cook, they kept three tight ends then. Lions only kept two last year between Hawkinson and Darren Fells. Fells, what's nice about him is he was a red zone threat. He added some receiving element, just didn't last very long. This is a better athlete. I think he's direct competition for Shane Zilstra. And if they believe Zilstra had a shot of making the team, this guy absolutely has a shot of making the team. That would mean keeping one less player at one spot, and that's going to be tough. But that's what's exciting is that this should be tough. These should be tough decisions. This should be a guy gets cut and you feel like he could be a player somewhere else, that he could make the roster elsewhere. This is going to be very tough for the Lions to slim down this roster, but we needed weapons. So continue to add the weapons, continue to add the competition. I'm here. I'm all for it. The guy's only 20 years old. Shows a lot of upside. He can be a matchup issue. And I can see what the Lions are looking for here. This is great competition for a guy like Shane Zilstra. So I wouldn't get too caught up. Well, they're saying he's going to play tight end. Okay, they're saying he's going to play tight end. But what role are they going to ask? I look at his Zilstra last season. I've seen some of what Jimmy Graham did back when he was with New Orleans. And I believe that is the type of role we could see where you can put him one-on-one on a linebacker. You split him out. You're not asking him to block all the time. He's not going to be your pure inline blocker. They want that. They got Garrett Griffin, right? They have Brock Wright. That's not what he is. He is a more of a receiving threat, which the Lions said that they're looking for. And this signing just backed that up once again. That's what they're looking for for this position. I think James Mitchell does well is he blocks really well, especially as a lead blocker second level. He's great for screens. So Devin Funches, who was used a lot of times to block on screens, and again, he showed that upside that, okay, he's willing to block. He just needs to be better keeping connection. If he can do that, he's got a legitimate shot here. I feel like he's got a legitimate shot, and you can see what the Lions are looking for. You just need to be impactful in the blocking assignments that you give him because he's not all the time to be in line, block, 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 block. It's just not his role. It doesn't play to his strengths. Why sign this kind of player if that's how you're going to utilize him? I don't know if he's going to make the team. It's going to be tough, but I love the fact that we added competition to this and we're continuing to add competition because we need that. We need more weapons. Who knows where he's at by the time the season starts? What if he's not ready by the time the season starts? What if James Mitchell, and I hope this is not the case, is not ready week one and they put him on the pup list or something? He's out for a few weeks. Who's your number two tight end? Is it Brock Wright? Is it changed it? Like, what is it then? So I think he could compete for your number three tight end. He could also compete for a potential practice squad role where if you need him down the line, if he gets cut and he can land back on the practice squad and be a guy that's like, okay, we don't have Hawkinson this week. We need that receiving threat. Okay, let's just let's just bring up Funches. He was on a practice squad last year with the Niners and he was still available. So I wouldn't doubt the fact that he could possibly land back on a practice squad. So don't overlook this signing. Don't overlook any signing. And that is Devin Funches as a Detroit Lion. Who would have thought when this guy was drafted that he'd end up being a Lion? I would have never thought. But here he is, and we'll see if he can do it. Let me know your thoughts, comments below. Thank you for watching, and I'm out.